All right, welcome back to our study um, of the War Scroll. Hallelujah. Um, the War Scroll is a scroll that was found with the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so, once upon a time, before I, um, I went on vacation, we started this book. And, you know, we did part one, you know, and so the War Scroll is about the final battle between the sons of light and the sons of darkness. And because it was so long ago that we done part one, you know, uh, I figured we would do a quick recap. Okay. Seems to be in order. Amen. All right, so. In part one, we learned that the War Scroll is a tactical treatise concerning the eschatological war betwixt the sons of darkness and the sons of light. Hallelujah. So the sons of darkness, you know, speaks to that which you find in darkness, which is confusion and blindness and falseness and lies and deceit and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? And the sons of light, everything that you find, um, in light, you know, with that Elohim is light, and in him is no darkness, you know, the Yahshua is light, you know, that light of every man's um, life, right? Yes. Um, the sons of darkness um, commander, you know, in the scroll is, is referred to as Belial. Their commander in chief is Belial, you know, um, and Belial does occur within our scriptures, you know, um, so their commander in chief is Bilal, AKA the head of evil spirits. He is an angel of hostility and he seeks to ensnare the Israelites in the last days. You know, as before mentioned, you know, there's no one closer to the last days than us. You know, so this, this should perk your ears, if, you know, um, and as well as your hearts as we go through this. You know, now we learned that Bilal and his enemies speak to the original enemies of Israel as well as um, those which violate Yah's covenant. But remember, one can only violate the covenant if they are part of the covenant. Amen? Amen. You know, so in other words, you know, many of our enemies are going to be those who we view as brothers and sisters in the faith. You know, and in some cases, brothers and sisters, even in the household. Amen. Amen. You know, this is what Yahshua warned us um, of, you know, and so this is the second witness to that. We also learned that Bilal represented something or someone that's worthless yet valuable, such as money or world government. Money is, in fact, worthless, yet it's valuable. Right. I mean, at the end of the day, it's just a piece of paper. Yeah. It is absolutely worthless. Yet it does have some value in, in, in the world setting. I mean, yes. you know, it's the same can be said of world government. Say a lot. Bilal's children or soldiers was known to be fags and drunkards. They are also known to be foolish, doubtful, merciless, liars, unforgiving. Mm. They have no part in Yahushua. Hence, they strengthen themselves against Yahushua, and neither do they know Yahuwah. In fact, they think they we're standing the two of them. Hmm. You know, and so that makes them our enemies. Amen. Amen. Last week, we learned that our enemies are to be treated as thorns, for they can't be taken with hands. You know, and this spoke to the cares of this world, fleeing from us. You know, um, the best way, you know, and, and this is a, this was a spiritual concept and a spiritual interpretation of that spiritual concept, you know, um, but we learned that our enemies are to be treated as thorns. You don't grab thorns with your hands. Amen. You know, it says for they can't be taken with hands, you know, and so this is imperative for those of us on the battlefield. We have to know that the way that we scrap, the way that we fight, the way that we do war is not with our hands. 
you know, maybe this is why Yahshua told us to be harmless as doves. Amen? Amen. You know, you know, now, as aforementioned, this spoke to the cares of, uh, of this world fleeing from us. You know, and yeah, no one wants to go without. But this spoke to the cares of this world fleeing from us. It is what it is, what, you know. Um, and, you know, when you think about it, you know, the Brit Kalashah, you know, um, our New Testament scriptures does bear witness to this, you know, um, in the in the last days when uh, all this stuff is going down with the beast and 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 uh, so on and so forth, we are told at some point that the saints will have trouble buying and selling. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen. Well, if you can't buy or sell, it's not going to take a long time for the cares of this world to flee from you. Yeah. Amen? Amen. Yeah. You know, now, uh, that said, the way that we combat them is with rational truths of Scripture. That is, be a spiritual warfare. Yeah. You know, we fight a spiritual war. We're supposed to be spiritual beings. Yeah. And if we're spiritual beings. We're supposed to be walking in the spirit. And we're supposed, if we're going to fight, we're supposed to fight a spiritual fight. Yeah. We have spiritual armor to put upon our spiritual selves. And we're supposed to be on a spiritual battlefield fighting a spiritual war. But yet, a lot of people want to lay hands on man suddenly. Mm -hmm. And I get it. Sometimes, you know, that man will make you want to do that. Yeah. Nevertheless, that's how not how y'all taught us. Right. And it's not going to get us anywhere, you know, but in the hands of the enemy. Mm -hmm. You know, so the way that we combat them is with rational truths of scripture mm -hmm. you know scripture that's our sword we'll use it rationally that not irrationally don't take the book and beat somebody over the head with it <laughs> you know rational that's all i'm saying on that right now say a lot yeah. all right so that's a recap of what we went over in part one so we're gonna jump on to part two. In part one, we got, you know, um, you know, we, we just got through verse one. First verse of column one. Okay, so we're still in column one. We're gonna go on to verses um, two and three. Now, verse two says, the sons of Levi, the sons of Yahud, and the sons of Benjamin, the exiles of the wilderness shall wage war against them. And it's speaking about these, um, this, this grouping of folks being the sons of light, you know, and so saying the sons of um, light, you know, uh, that are exiles in the wilderness shall war, war against them, you know, and that they are of Levi, the sons of Yahudah, and the sons of Benjamin, and the exiles of the wilderness. Okay, now, um, may not be familiar with the exiles of, of the wilderness and and how you know these folks got into the wilderness, you know, uh, but you know during the Second Temple period, you know, uh, the true priests were kicked out of the temple. They were forced into the wilderness, you know, and you know uh, where they where they formed communities, and you know so um, that's where they lived, you know. Now. The war scroll goes on to say, it's cut off, but it picks back up. It's, it goes on to say in verse 3, according to all their truths, when the exiles, the sons of light, return from the wilderness of the peoples to encamp in the wilderness of Jerusalem, after the battle, they shall depart from there. Okay, so it's talking about this eschatological war, you know, this war that comes down at the end times. You know, and this is the, you know, the end of humanity, the war that will, you know, end humanity as we know it, you know, and it's going to be fought with the sons of light who are made up of the sons of Levi, the sons of Yahudah, the sons of Benjamin, and the other exiles of the wilderness, you know, and, you know, and they're going to wage war against the sons of darkness. When will this happen? When they return from the wilderness of the people.
to encamp in the wilderness of Jerusalem. That's when it happened. Okay, you know, so now this got me to thinking because I'm like, okay, I I remember that. I remember that that um that that saying, the wilderness of the people. You know, and it speaks of the wilderness of, of the people in Ezekiel. You know, and you know, and so you know, even though it was cut off, you know, I determined that this is speaking of Yah. You know, um, you know, based upon what it's saying here and the prophecy that I know about in Ezekiel, as well as what comes in verse four. So let me have my first reader read Ezekiel 20, verses 33 through 38, please. As I live, saith the Adonai Yahuwah, surely, with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm, and with fury poured out, will I rule over you. And I will bring you out from the people and will gather you out of the countries where ye are scattered with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the people, and there will I plead with you face to face. Like as I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so will I plead with you, saith Adonai Yahuwah. And I will cause you to pass under the rod, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. And I will purge out from you among from among you the rebels and them that transgress against me. I will bring them forth out of the country where they sojourn, and they shall not enter into the land of Israel, and ye shall know that I am Yahuwah. Hallelujah. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. Okay, so this is the prophecy um, that Yah was speaking about. You know, he says, as he lived, surely with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with fury poured out, he will rule over. And he says he will bring us, he will, he will bring the people into the wilderness of the people. Okay. Now, the war scroll speaks about some, uh, some folks that's in the wilderness of the people that when they return from the wilderness. So this is a prophecy about Yah saying he will take them into a wilderness of people. You know, and so but it also speaks of when he when he's going to bring them out as well. And this is found in verses 39 through 44. My next reader, please. As for you, O house of Israel, thus saith the Adonai, Yahuwah, go ye carry ye everyone his idols, and hereafter also, if ye will not hearken unto me, but pollute my holy name no more with your gifts and with your idols. For in my holy mountain, in the mountain of the height of Israel, saith the Aramite Yahuwah, there shall all the house of Israel, all of them in the land, serve me. There will I accept them, and they will I acquire, require your offerings and the first fruits of your oblations with all your holy things. I will accept you with your sweet savior when I bring you out from the people and gather you out of the country where ye have been scattered. And I will sanctify, sacrifice, sacrifice, no, sanctify in you before the heathen. And you shall know that I am Yahuwah when I shall bring you into the land of Israel, into the country for the which I lifted up my hand to give to your fathers. And there shall you remember your ways and all your doings wherein ye have been defiled, and you shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for all your evils that ye have commanded, yes. committed. And ye shall know that I am Yahuwah when, when I have wrought with you from my name's sake, not according to your wicked ways, now according to your corrupt thing, doings, O ye house of Israel, saith the Adonai Yahuwah. Hallelujah. Okay, so we sing you know, in the first uh, uh, passages that he spoke about bringing them into the wilderness of people, 
you know, and here in, in, in verses 39 through 44, he's talking about um, that he will bring them out, you know. Um, yeah, he said uh, in verse 39, as for you, O house of Israel, thus says Adonai Yahua, in verse 40, he says, for in my holy mountain, and in the mountain of the height of Israel, you know, his holy mountain was Mount, um, was Mount Zion, and the mountain of the heights of Israel was Jerusalem, you know. Um, he says, there shall all of Israel and all of the land serve him. Hallelujah. And he says, when I bring you out from the people and gather you out of the countries wherein ye have been scattered. You know, and so he was talking about sending them into a wilderness of the people, but he's going to bring them out from those, from the wilderness of the people where, where uh, he has scattered them in, in the, uh, amongst the peoples in, the, in various countries. He says, when he does so, he should know that I am Yahuwah yeah. when I shall bring you into the land of Israel. You know, and he shall know that I am Yahuwah when I have brought with you for my name's sake. And that's a really important point there. He's doing it for his name's sake. Right. He's not doing it because, because uh, you know, you're so righteous. You know, he's not doing it because you know, you're so saintly, you know, and, and you know, and he can't do without you, you know. No. That, hence he says, not according to your wicked ways, nor according to your corrupt doing, O ye house of Israel. No, but for his name's sake. You know, so he's really, really adamant about his name. You know, and that's an important point, you know, to take with you. You know, he's doing it for his name's sake. You know, and remember, name speaks to the character, authority, and reputation of a thing. Right. You know, so you know, you're going to have his name upon you, mm. and that means you're going to have his character, authority, right. and reputation right. upon you. Right. Don't take it in vain. Amen. Right. Right. Verse four of the War Scroll, column one, says other is cut off. It picks back up other kitchen in Mitzrayim or Egypt. When his time has arrived, he shall march out with great fury to wage war against the kings of the north. His wrath aiming at exterminating and cutting off the horn. All right. So now he's talking about war with the kings of the north. Yeah. You know, and I measure and stick it off. There's also a prophecy about the kings of the north. There's actually several, but I chose this one. Jeremiah 25, 26, and 27. And all the kings of the north, far and near, one with another, and all the kingdoms of the world, which are upon the face of the earth, and the king Cheshach shall drink after them. Therefore thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith Yahuwah Zabaoth, the Elohim of Israel, Drink ye and be drunken, and spew and fall, and rise no more, because of the sword which I will send among you. Hallelujah. You know, and so here it is, you know, there, here's a prophecy that we're to rage war against the kings of the north. Now, you know, you know, seeing that we're supposed to be a spiritual people and that we're supposed to walk in the spirit and all these things, these things are the spirit. I'm looking at this from a spiritual concept or from a spiritual view. And so when we start talking about all the kings of the north, we're talking about kings that are that are in obscurity kings that are darkened you know when we look at the word north it's our number 6828 it means to be hidden you know um or obscure you know something that's obscure is something that's hidden you know that is dark so another way of looking at this is saying you know the wage war against the hidden the kings that are hidden or the kings that are in darkness, you know, um, you know, and that becomes that becomes real, real relevant in our day and time. You know, could there be some kings that's operating in high places that are hidden, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that are darkened and in darkness, yes. Yes. being ruled by darkness and mm -hmm. the prince of darkness? Yes. Yes. Maybe even a son of Belial. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yes. You know, it also spoke about cutting off of, the, of a horn. 
You know, this reminded me of Yermi Yahoo 48, 25, and 26. It said, the horn of Moab is cut off and his arm is broken, saith Yahuwah. Make ye him drunken, for he magnified himself against Yahuwah. Moab also shall, shall wallow in his vomit and he shall be in derision. Mm -hmm. You know, I thought that was interesting. They both, you know, um, become drunken. Mm -hmm. You know, but here it is, it's talking about, you know, Moab being cut off. It's talking about kings of the north, you know, um, even as the war scroll, you know, we do have prophecies that speak to these things. You know, this word horn is Karen, you know, number 7160. It speaks to a horn as projecting of, of strength. You know, it speaks of strength to push or to gore. Mm. You know, um, so a horn, you know, symbolizes, you know, power, strength, and speaking, and teaching, and writing. You know, hence also in reasoning and and arguing and debating. You know, so that's another way of looking at this. You know, um, and he talk, he's saying he's gonna cut off the horn. He's gonna cut off, you know, those that that power to to do these things. Probably because they're leading people astray. Mm -hmm. All right. Verses five through eight. It's cut off, it cuts off, it picks back up a time of salvation for Elohim's people and a time of dominion for all the men of his lot, but of everlasting destruction for all the lot of Belial. There shall be panic. Mm -hmm. It cuts off, picks back up. The sons of, of Japhet, I sure sh um, shall fall down. There will be no rescue for it. The kingdom's dominion shall come to an end. Wickedness being subdued without a remnant, neither shall there be an escape for the sons of darkness. Mm -hmm. They're not going to get away. They're not going to escape. Right. Verse 8. But the sons of righteousness shall shine unto the utmost ends of the world, going on to shine till the completion of all the appointed times of darkness. At the appointed time of Elohim, his exalted greatness shall shine to all the ends of the cuts off, the probably the ends of the world. You know, but something I wanted to hone in on. It says, you know, that the sons of the righteousness shall, righteousness shall shine unto all the utmost ends of the world. Mm -hmm. And it, it says that they're going to go on to shine to the completion of all the appointed times of darkness. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's an important concept. You know, that there are appointed times of darkness. Right. And, you know, and I don't think a lot of people, you know, actually think about that or ponder upon that. But there are appointed times of darkness. And see, you need to know and understand this. See, because when you're trying to get something done and you're doing it in an appointed time of darkness, it's not going to farewell for you if right. you're a son of light right. because you're trying to do it at a time when darkness is at its strongest yeah. when darkness is ruling it would behoove you to try to do it when the light is ruling yes. when it's a time of light why so you can see what you're doing you yeah. can understand what you're doing and if you're doing it properly See, there are appointed times of darkness. You got to know, you got to understand this. You know, because there's too many children of light trying to work in darkness. Yeah. Yahshua said, you know, the darkness comes in which no man can work. Yeah. See, but, but because of the ignorance of the, of the sons of light, and the children of light, they try to go and work in the darkness. Mm. You know, you, you you shouldn't even do that. It's natural. That's right. You know, in the natural, you know, they have folks that work the midnight shift. Mm -hmm. That is, they work all through the darkness. Mm -hmm. Another name for the midnight shift is the graveyard yeah, shift. Yeah. They call it the graveyard shift because it'll send you to the graveyard. Yeah. Amen? Amen. That's no shift for a child of light. Yeah. yeah. Say lie. You know, now 
But does our measuring stick speak to appointed times of darkness? Well, of course, of course it does. In Revelation 12, 12, we're told it says, therefore rejoice ye heavens, ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you having great wrath, because he knoweth that he have but a short time. Yeah. He has but a short time. That means he has some time. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. He has some time. You know, no matter how short it is, he don't need much. Right. You know, Revelations 11, 2 says, but the court, which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles in the holy city, shall they tread under for 40 and two months. This is a time of darkness. Right. This is a time that's appointed to darkness. You know, this is a time when the darkness will be ruling, when they will be, when they will be uh, treading underfoot the holy city. Amen? Amen. So, you know, I want you to know that there are appointed times of darkness. Yeah. You know, first the natural, then the spiritual. If we just look at a regular day or a regular year, you know, Yah's orchestrated time periods. There are times of darkness. There are appointed times of darkness. Within a day, you know, you have light as well as darkness. Darkness has its own appointed time. Amen? Amen. Now, as the days travel through the years, there are days that have more darkness and less light. Right. Amen? Amen? And there are days that have more light and less darkness. Yep. So, if you're a son of a light or a child of the light, wouldn't it behoove you to try to get your tax done during the light, yeah. Yeah. during the times when there's light, the most light, you have the most probability of success. Yeah. See, it's, it's no coincidence that most of your suicides, mm -hmm. most of uh, more crime, you know, on in, in every facet rises okay. when in the dark portion of the year, that is yeah. the winter time. See, now a lot of people relate it to the holidays. And I used to as well, but now I don't. Now I relate it to the time of darkness. Yeah. As the fall go into the winter, that is the night portion of the year. Yeah. That's when the darkness is ruling over the light. Mm -hmm. The day is the shortest. Sun may go down at five o'clock. You know, and the darkness is is out for up to 12 hours. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, for up to 18 hours, actually. You know. So it's clear to see that the darkness is rude. But then that's when you have people who want to they want to go to work. You know, they want to try to get something done. That's not the time. Not if you're a child of the day. That's not the time. Yeah. You know, so learn. You know, um, I didn't mean to go down that rabbit trail, but <laughs> hallelujah anyway. Also, let us take um, a look at 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 7. It says, now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Adonai, Yahushua Mashiach, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, nor be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as the day of Mashiach is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there be a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called Elohim, or that is worshipped, so that he as Elohim sitteth in the temple of Elohim, showing himself that he is Elohim. Remember ye not when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and now ye know that now ye know what with hold of that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doeth already work, only he who now let him will let until he be taken out of the way. Again, there's an appointed time to darkness. And if you're a child of the light, you need to figure out when is your time and when is the enemy's time. Now the children of the, the children of the day, the children of the light, what do we do when it gets dark? 
Exactly. We go to bed. Hallelujah. You know, so we at we at rest. <laughs> and while we're resting, we, we're getting recharged, we're getting rebuilt, you know, we're getting revitalized. So when when the sun arises, when the joy come in the morning, we can get up and we can do something. Amen. We can be productive. I pray somebody getting somebody. Yeah. Yeah. You know, verses nine and ten of the War Scroll Column One says, "For um, it cuts off and picks back up. It says, for peace and blessing, glory, joy, and long life for all the sons of life. Mm -hmm. On the day of the kingdom's fall, there shall be a clash and fierce carnage before Elohim of Israel. For this is the day He has appointed long ago." For a destructive war against the sons of darkness. Mm -hmm. On this day, they shall clash in a great carnage, the congregation of divine beings and the assembly of men. You know, and our measuring stick speaks of such a time. It's found in Revelation 19, 16 through 19. My next reader, please. And you have on the vesper, vesper, and on the vesper, and on his thigh, a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in, that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great Elohim, that ye may eat the flesh of the king and the flesh of the captain and the flesh of the mighty of mighty one of mighty men and the flesh of horses and, and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bound both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their name and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. Hallelujah. And we know they're not gonna have no, they're not gonna have a snowball chance right. in, in Hades, right? That's right. There will be plenty of carnage that day. You know, so much so that Yah says, come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great Elohim that ye may eat the flesh of kings. Mm -hmm. And the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and them that sit upon them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. That sounds like a lot of carnage to me. Yes. Amen. Yes. Verses 11 and 12 um, of column one of the war scroll. It says the sons of light and the lot of darkness shall fight each other to disclose the might of Elohim with the uproar of a large multitude and the war cry of divine beings and men. On the day of calamity, this is a time of tribulation. The people whom Elohim redeems of all the tri their tribulations, none was comparable or comparable to this because of this hastening towards the end for an everlasting redemption in the day of their war against the kids. Now, I'd like to introduce y'all to a concept that was widely believed by the ancient Zadokite priests of the Dead Sea Scrolls, you know, and that is divine beings and men fighting side by side you know uh and you know essentially they believe that we're that we're not always if ever alone oh, yeah. Yeah. that said we don't worship y'all alone nor do we battle against the forces of darkness alone yeah. this notion is admitted admittedly obscure within our measuring stick nevertheless it is not unprecedented you know, it is found, you know, in scripture and throughout scripture in all actuality, yeah. you know, if you have eyes to see. Let us consider uh, Second Chronicles 32, 7 and 8, verses 7 and 8. My next reader, please. Be strong and courageous. Be not afraid nor dismayed for the king of Assyria, nor for, <clears throat> nor for all the multitude that is with him. For there be more with us than with him. With him is an is an arm of flesh, but with us is Yahuwah our Elohim to help us and to fight our battles. And the people rested themselves upon the words of Hezekiah the king of Judah. Hallelujah! All right, this is this is King Hezekiah speaking, right? Yes. You know, and did you see what he said in verse seven? For there be more with us than with him. Hallelujah. He says, with him is an arm of flesh, but with us is Yahuwah Elohim to help us to fight our battle. Yes. 
See, this is what they believe, the ancient priests believe. They believe that Yah was right with yeah. Israel when they were on the battlefield. They also believe when they was worshiping and they were pray, praising Yah, that there was angels worshiping and praising right along with them. Yeah. Isn't that a wonderful thought? Yeah. You know, also let us consider 2 Kings 6, 15 through 17. My next reader, please. Hallelujah. All right. Now, this is, of course, the story of Elisha, you know, says and said in verse 15, and when the servant of the man of Elohim had risen early and gone forth and behold, a host compassed the city with horses and with chariots. So he's seen that, hey, look, all these all these folks here. All these, all these folks here, and we're surrounded. What do we do? Amen. Amen. You know, but Elisha says, you're not. Don't even worry about it. That's right. That's we got way more with us than they have. We covered. Hallelujah. You know, see, sometimes y'all has you covered, but you can't see. That's, that's right. right. That's right. You know, sometimes you're not going to have an Elisha right next to you to pray for me. Yes. Sometimes you have to just have faith and believe right. that if you are a child of the Most High, that He's not going to leave nor forsake you. Yeah. You're going to have to trust and believe that He's yeah. there and He has your back. Yeah. But it just so happens that this servant did have Elisha with him, and he prayed for him, and and he prayed that his eyes be opened, and Yahuwah opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw and behold, the whole mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Now take note, it didn't say that they was around the city. It said they was around the servant of the Most High El. They was around Elisha. And if you're a servant, they're going to surround you. They're going to protect you with the same vigor that they that they protected him. Amen? Amen. Thank you, God. So we're never alone. The ancient priests of Israel never believed that they were alone. Even when they couldn't see them, they believed that they were there. Now, this concept also sheds light upon other passages that appear obscure without this understanding, such as Genesis 32, 1 and 2. It says, and Yaakov went on his way, and the angels of Elohim met him. And when Yaakov saw them, he said, this is Elohim's host. And he called the name of that place Mahanaim. You know, he, he was there. He seen Elohim's host. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he was about to go into a battle. He didn't know it, but he was about to go into a battle. You know, and so he did. Give me one second. All right. So. Let's, let us also consider Joshua 5, 13 through 15. It says, and it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went, up, went unto him and said unto him, Are thou for us or for our adversary? You know, like as if you with them. We in trouble. I got to. I got to get on my knees. I, I got to get. I got to get face down in the dirt. You know. And he said, "Nay, but as captain of the host of Yahuwah, am I now come?" And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and then worshipped. 
and said unto him, What sail my Adonai unto his servant? Servant. And the captain of Yahuwah's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. We not never alone, y'all. We not never alone. I know sometimes you may feel like you're going through. Sometimes you may feel like you are by yourself, like nobody cares. Let me tell you, you are never alone when you are in Yah. Yah is always with us. His angels are around us. He's always encamped in the midst of our, of our camp. Hallelujah. He's not going to leave us alone. All right, now, the, um, the end of verse 12 says, the, uh, verse 11 says, this is a time of tribulation. And then it also said, you know, um, the people whom Elohim redeems of all their tribulations was, was, uh, was comparable to this. None of their tribulations, none of, ah, of all their tribulations, none was comparable to this. In other words, you know, the tribulation that these people would go through was uncomparable. It was un uncomparable, you know, um, you know, to any other tribulation, any other humans would have to have went through up until this time. You know, and our Messiah, he too warned us of such a time. You know, and this is this falls right in the line with what our Messiah taught us in Matthew Yahoo 24, 15 through 21. It says, when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whoso read him, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee unto the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down and take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, yes. neither yes. on the Sabbath day. Yes. For then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be. So they're both talking about a time of tribulation yeah. that's uncomparable to any other tribulation mm -hmm. anyone has ever went through. Right. You know, and so, yes, our measuring stick does speak of such a time. And did you catch verse 20? It says, but pray ye that your flight be not in the winter. Why not in the winter? Darkness. Hallelujah. Somebody listening. Thank you, God. I know I'm not alone. Hallelujah. That's right. Yes. Because it's a time of darkness. It's an appointed time of darkness. That's when the darkness rules. Those of us that serve other light, we sleep. We rest. All right. Now, it also said the people whom Elohim redeems, and it also spoke about because of his hastening towards the end for an everlasting redemption. So it's also speaking about during this time of this great tribulation that's incomparable to any other type of tribulation that came upon the earth, that there's going to be a redemption of Yah's people. Hallelujah. And scripture also speaks to this in Revelations 14. One through five, it reads, and I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him a hundred and forty-four thousand, having his name, his father's name written in their forehead. And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung as it were a new song before the throne, and before the four beasts, and the elders, and no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. Yes. These are they which are, were not defiled with women for they are virgins. Yes. These are they which follow the lamb whithersoever he goes. These were redeemed from among men being the first fruits unto Elohim and to the lamb. And in their mouth when he found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of Elohim. Hallelujah. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. I don't know about you, but I want to be in that camp. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Then we have verses 13 through 17 of column one to, to wrap it up. It's 
it cuts off and it picks up. It says carnage. Mm. And then it says during the war, the sons of light shall strengthen for three lots and smite wickedness. But for three lots, the army of Belial shall gird itself for the return of the lot. There shall be skirmishing battalions to melt the heart and the might of Elohim supporting the heart of the sons of light. During the seventh lot, the great hand of Elohim shall subdue the angels of his dominion for all the men of, it cuts off, it picks back up, the holy ones, he shall appear in hell, cuts off, pick back up, truth for the destruction of the sons of darkness. Then it cuts off, pick back up, great cuts off, pick back up, they shall set the hand to cuts off. But what I want to point out that is speaking about a war between the sons of light and the sons of darkness. Now within this war, there's going to be seven main battles. Three of the battles are going to be won by the sons of light. And three of the battles are going to be won by the sons of darkness. But that seventh battle, all right. All right. Elohim shall subdue oh, yes. all yes. darkness. Amen. Yes. You know, and so that's what it's that's what it's talking about. Yes. Yes. You know, and and we um go to verse 16, we see it speaks about some type of truth for the destruction of the sons of darkness. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's important, that's an important to, to, to remember, important to understand and to know. You know that our weapon is truth. Truth is a weapon. Yes. Yeah. You know, yes. hence yeah. scripture is called the sword. You know, because scripture is truth. Yeah. It is a weapon. And don't you know? Okay, so in, in scripture, I it represents truth, and it's a weapon. Then what would the enemy be coming at us with? Deception. Deception. Not the word I'm looking for, though. The serpent. And scripture is truth, and truth is our spiritual weapon. Then what is the spiritual weapon of the sons of darkness? Falsehood, absolutely. Falsehoods, lies. That's how, that's their weapon. See, a lot of people are looking for them to come and just start beating folks upside the head. They're not coming to beat you upside the head. They're coming to get inside your head. See, that's where verse 14 come in. It says there should be skirmishing battalions. What are they, what are they here to do? To melt the heart and the might of Elohim supporting the heart of the sons of light. See, this is how they're going to come against us. Right. They're going to fight against what's in here, what's in our heart. Yeah. Yeah. They're going to try to melt our hearts. Mm -hmm. To melt the hearts means to make us succumb to fear. Yeah. Yes. When someone heart metal, it's that's a terminology to say that one is filled with fear. That's what they're going to try to do. They're going to try to melt the heart of the sons of life. And they're going, and, and the might of Elohim supporting the heart. What is the might of Elohim supporting the heart? It is scripture. Yep. 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 So you can see that the way that they're going to be fighting us is they're going to come against what's in our hearts. Yep. 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 And they're going to come up against what the word say. So if you say, hey, the word calls firm pharmakia, witchcraft, and sorcery. They're going to say, if you don't get this, you're going to die. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which one are you going to believe? Yeah, is giving us the truth That's right. for the destruction of the sons of darkness. That's yeah. right. We have everything we need. All we have to do is trust it and believe it. And that's hard for a lot of people to do. See, but you have to know and understand that the battlefield is your heart. See, this is why the Messiah, when he came, you know, all he spoke about 
was the kingdom of Elohim. Where's the kingdom of Elohim? It's in your heart. You know, he spoke about, you know, good seed being sown in your heart and bad seed being sown in your heart. He spoke about enemies being in the kingdom of Elohim. That is in your heart. That's where the battle takes place. The enemy seeks to melt your heart, to fill you with fear. This is why scripture teaches us that Yah did not give us the spirit of fear so that when you feel that fear come in, you know where it's from. And then when you know where it's from, then you get the opportunity to choose. Are you going to adhere to the fear? Or are you going to adhere to the word? That's all I have for you. Hallelujah.